Analids. Ooh, I like worms. In this video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about analids or the segmented worm. But first, let's just prove a few myths about analids. Analids are often misrepresented in media. <laughs> just I explained about. I saw it! It was big! It was all wiggly! And it ate everything! It's horrible! It was an Alaskan bullworm! Sounds like a lot of... It sounds like a lot of... Hoopla! Sounds like a... Hoopla! Oh, how right you are, my little friend. Because what SpongeBob doesn't know, probably because he does not have a brain, is first that there's no such thing as an Alaskan bullworm. Second, not all annelids are earthworms, and if the worm was living underwater like this, it would have small bundles of bristles or setae protruding out of its body to assist it with movement. And last, annelids have no tongues, and in fact, its food consists of small live organisms or fragments of dead organisms which it grasps by means of powerful jaws located at the tip of an irreversible muscular farnet. But its jaw would not be nearly powerful enough to grasp a sea sponge or a sea star, or a squirrel for that matter. Enough fun. Now it's time to get to the good stuff. There are two main types of annelids. Polychaetes, which are underwater, saltwater worms with parapoida sticking out. Parapoida are multi-purpose limb-like structures that help underwater worms to crawl or swim, and in many cases, to breathe. And clitalates, which was recently created as the culmination of two subclasses. Those subclasses are oligochates, which are mostly underground worms, such as earthworms, and perudinia, which are mostly freshwater worms, such as leeches, which are undoubtedly the most awesome animals on the planet. If you don't believe me, just ask Ms. Jen. Most annelids remain in damp soil, burrowing in sand or mud, while some remain in freshwater habitats in the sea, using their parapoida to swim. Here's a typical cross-section of an annelid, like the one you have in front of you on the handout. Annelids typically have two columns in each segment, seen in orange on your papers, which is in keeping with their bilateral symmetry. Annelids use their column as part of their hydrostatic skeleton and as a storage place for materials like waste, food, and gametes. Instead of bones, annelids use column fluid, membranes called peritoneum, and muscles as support. This makes up a hydroskeleton. They have two types of muscle. Circular muscle, in baby blue on your papers, is just inside the skin. And longitudinal muscle, in purple on your papers, is thicker and deeper towards the center. Annelids can inch forward by flexing one set of muscles while using the other set to expand and anchor the body. This is called peristalsis, which can be thought of as a wave of, in muscles running down the body. Some annelids can swim using their parapoida. Annelids have a complete digestive tract that includes a one-way gut, in blue on your papers that takes food from the mouth to the anus. They have organs like gizzards to grind up food and their gut helps carry food and waste to all parts of the body. Annelids also have kidney-like organs called nephridia in green on your paper that excrete waste as urine. Annelids also have a closed circulatory system which they use to transport blood and oxygen to different parts of the body. Most annelids exchange gases or breathe through the skin. However, underwater annelids tend to have gills. Most annelids have brains accompanied by two fused nerve cords running down the length of the body. In each segment, these nerve cords are connected, creating a ladder-like network. These annelids also have sensory organs, such as antenna and taste buds, which can make them sensitive to things like light and touch. Many annelid life cycles, especially underwater annelids, are unknown. What we do know is that overall, the group has various reproductive ways. Most land annelids are hermaphrodites, i.e. have mo both the male and female sex organs. And while animals like leeches always reproduce sexually, many annelids reproduce asexually. Inter interestingly enough, some annelids can use the properties of asexual reproduction to regrow segments that they lose in accident. 
So when we talk about reproduction, analytes can cover all ends of the spectrum. So now that we've covered the basics about analytes, let's understand why they're important. In many ecosystems, analytes like earthworms are responsible for aerating and fertilizing the soil they live in by eating the decaying material, leaving holes in the ground, like the ones seen in the picture, that help recycle the soil, and then they def defecate the, that decaying material, leaving behind the necessary nutrients for plant growth. They are also important prey to birds that allow them to survive. Marine analysts convert organic debris in the ocean into carbon dioxide, which plankton then use in photosynthesis. This process is very important to maintaining our oxygen supply. Scientists also believe that analysts were the first animals to display segmentation, which allows animals to grow larger in size without needing a lot of DNA. Analyst species like the great Australian earthworm can grow to be almost 10 feet long. Analysts are the first animals to have a closed respiratory system and paired appendages in the form of parapodia. The analyst phylum contains the first animals with brains. Now, as you think about all of that, let's watch the conclusion of SpongeBob and Sandy.